AJ, how's your week going? So far, so good, Ned. How about yours? Going well, going well. We're in the thick of earnings season. Last I counted, we had at least 12 airline earning calls this week, uh, the week ending October 27th. And uh, so <laughs> we're in the thick of it. That's for sure. Keeping us busy. Absolutely. Earning our keep. Yep. So Jay, you got a chance to listen to Hawaiian Airlines. How did they do in the third quarter? Not good, Ned. Not good at all. Uh, they've had a streak of not doing well since uh, really since the end of the pandemic. Uh, they just give you their operating margin, negative 8% on the operating margin for the third quarter. Uh, and they lost about $55 million at special items at the net level. They still have uh, a few areas of uh, of distress. One is they are exposed to this whole gear turbofan engine from Pratt and engines from Pratt and Whitney. Uh, their neos, their three twenty neos, are uh, twenty one neos are um, are uh, that that whole fleet has been disrupted because of that engine right. issue, and that's a huge huge headache for them. They have uh, you know I think um, Japan is still a problem for them. That was really bad a year ago. Now they said that the man from Japan, you know, Japanese tourists visiting Hawaii, that's at least come back in volume terms, started to come back in volume terms. Sounds like the yields still aren't so great. And that at the same time, there's uh, some more capacity getting dumped into that market in part uh, because some airlines want to preserve their slots at uh, Haneda Airport. And there's a deadline on that where if they don't use them, they lose them. So, did, did Hawaiian talk about their their slots at Haneda? That's something that uh, United Airlines is pushing to take their their Kona slot, um, or the slot they use. It's the nighttime slot that they use for Kona and Honolulu. Uh, any? Did they make any comments about that? Are they going to sit on that slot and make sure it's flown just to, so they don't have to give it up? I don't believe they came up in the call. I don't recall okay. hearing that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's uh, but that is that's a good good point you bring up there. That's that's an issue that uh, that's on, on the table at Hawaiian, and uh, yeah, I think there's just other things going on there too. The uh, they did say that uh, you know domestic Hawaiian is not quite as robust as it was, you know, immediately coming out after the pandemic. Like think about a year ago, and yeah, everybody was running to get on planes and all Americans that is, and they weren't quite flying international yet because a lot of markets are still closed so uh demand domestic demand to places like hawaii was really fantastic and now that's cooled off a bit i don't think it's bad but it's just it's cooled off uh and then you know the, within hawaii the state of hawaii itself which is a you know an island market there's uh right. there, are no, there are no trains running between no trains between and no markets. boats either so um, not even any yeah. boats so you gotta fly if you want to go between you know one island and the other uh, but that market is very competitive right now because Southwest is flying there, and Hawaiian says, you know, we're we're beating them. We we get we get a, our load factor is a lot higher, our unit revenues are a lot higher, but at the same time, that uh, it's still you know just that competition is still a drag. So so a lot of uh, a lot of things not going right at Hawaiian, and I you know should remind everybody that uh, Hawaiian just had a fantastic decade. Uh, in the 2010s, um, there are a couple of years in in the teens there. 20, I want to say 2016 ish, 2017 ish, when Hawaiian was, uh, you know, one of the most profitable airlines in the world, and that had a lot to do with, uh, you know, just these tremendously profitable uh, companies like, uh, well, not even companies, but saying these places with tremendous wealth growth like California and Seattle, right. um, all these, you know, just Tech, tech people with all sorts of money that were visiting Hawaii for vacation. So it was just a great decade for them. Uh, but the start of the 2020s has just been absolutely uh, is miserable, too strong a word. I don't know, but it's it's been rough. Yeah, no, clearly. It's uh, you know, it's funny you bring back the bring up the uh the Hawaiian's history. You know, they had a great uh, 2010s as they grew. It's uh, it makes me wonder if just if Hawaiian's just gotten too big for the market, if maybe it's time to talk about shrinking. And of course, they're not going to say that. And I don't, I you know it's uh, but at the same time, Hawaii is a limited market. Like how you know, it, with everything coming back slowly, it's like can they really grow with the with the plans that they had with seven eight sevens and everything coming in? But 
you know, right. we shall see. I mean, it's, yeah, you are very dependent on, you know, Hawaii inbound tourism to Hawaii. And that's, uh, you know, that's pretty only game in town. And that's been, you know, it's a very, very large market. It's a very lucrative market. It's done, done well for many years. But uh, yeah, when the moment you dial down demand from Japan, for example, or if California demand starts the weekend, then Hawaiian gets into trouble. Now, you know, raises the interesting question, would anyone ever buy Hawaiian? Um, I don't know that one of the big three would would do it just because there may be some antitrust concerns, although you never know. Uh, but, you know, a company like Alaska comes up as uh, would, would Hawaii be kind of a nice addition to their network, considering in Alaska's case that uh, there's not a tremendous amount of growth prospects if you start looking five, 10 years down the road. So yeah, interesting thing, you know, something to think about. Yeah, no, we shall see. It's uh, It's been interesting watching Hawaiian and seeing how they're doing. Oh, one last question before we move on to the next airline we we'll talk about. Uh, did they talk about their new cargo business with Amazon? Did that come up? Is that is that starting to... to yeah, you know, yeah, it did, it did come up. Um, yeah, it did come up. I don't think it's something that uh, that they spoke about at length. They, they have spoken about that in more detail in previous calls. Um, and yeah, I think that's a nice little business for them. They're using, I think, three thirty Airbus three thirties, I believe, um, to uh, support that business. And uh, you have to imagine it's, um, you know, it's also good for utilization. And it's, um, you know, I think it was great. I mean, one issue with 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 doing something like that is, so I mean, it's great when you have, let's say, a surplus of pilots, and now you have, you know, this sort of side business to to uh, give them something to do, so to speak. Um, you do wonder if, you know, when business is really, really booming, uh, do you want those pilots flying the cargo planes or would you rather have them flying an extra frequency to, to Los Angeles or whatever? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just an aside. I think it, I think that's, uh, you know, a nice, nice side business for them. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that is a good question. Don't forget to, another thing that did come up in the call is, uh, they talk about the, the Dreamliners that they'll yes. be getting. What did they say? Is it the end of, is it December or January? Yeah, real soon. It's real soon. It's coming <laughs> real up. Real soon. There we go. Yeah, real soon. We'll hedge ourselves. But yeah, they um, there those things are coming, and uh, that'll be you know interesting aircraft for them. One thing they like about it is that it does have more premium seats than the uh, you know three thirties, and they say premium is doing very well right now, which should surprise none of our listeners because uh, just about every airline in the world is saying that you know premium, premium, premium is doing uh, you know is is all firing on all cylinders. So they're happy about that. And they'll be flying it. I think they said, uh, listen to the call this morning quickly. I have to go back and double check this. I believe they said they would like ideally to fly the, the, the 787 Dreamliners to a market like New York. Very long haul stage length with a lot of premium demand. You can imagine a market like New York easily fill up that premium cabin. Um, but initially they're going to put it on uh los angeles and san francisco um i think that just has to do with uh you know some speaking to their ceo a few mm -hmm. weeks ago and that's part yeah they've got maintenance staff on the ground yeah. in san francisco and la they can if there's any issues they can address it rather than getting stranded all the way on the east coast right more of a training uh, slash operational reason for doing that initially uh than a market reason but i but i think they're eyeing those for for those real long haul markets definitely definitely So uh, yeah, we spoke at length about Hawaiian. We had uh, also Valaris uh, went this morning, the Mexican low cost carrier. I did not get a chance to listen to their call yet, but you did, Ned. So tell us about Valaris. Yeah, so it's it's actually an interesting, uh, comparable story to Hawaiian. You know, we had an airline that for for much of the 2010s was sort of early a profitability powerhouse. You know, double digit margins and everything growth like there was no tomorrow and they've really had a rocky year i mean they've had a number of issues there's uh capacity constraints at mexico city you know the category two rating for safety rating for mexico by the u.s meant they couldn't grow to the u.s which was uh, previously one of their biggest growth markets so there was over capacity in the domestic mexican market and uh you know in the third quarter which isn't their peak quarter of the year but still it's you know it's it's good to watch they they had a five percent operating margin and a net loss so it wasn't a great time and Valeris, looking forward, still has has a lot of constraints. Uh, it's sort of the same of the same things that we mentioned for Hawaiian. The Pratt and Whitney Q 
geared turbofan issue is is really hitting Valeris. They're an all Airbus A320 operator. Uh, they have 126 aircraft in their fleet, of which 16 or about 13% are grounded at this point because of the engine issues. And that's um, and as a result, they're they're cutting their third their full year 2023 capacity growth by three points to up roughly 10%. So that's uh, it's not not a great story for them. The they uh, Enrique Villatrina, their CEO, did talk a lot about getting compensation from RTX Pratt Whitney's parent on that. That has not been agreed to, and will be reflected in future releases. He said. But of course, that doesn't change the operating numbers. That's going to be a special item that will be a one-time boost. So it, it's interesting listening to them. They, But at the same time, they're talking about this capacity discipline that they're being forced to operate. One, the GTF issue. Two, they're, they're losing more flights in Mexico City come January is actually somewhat good for yields because they're everyone's forced to they're, they're being forced to cut and, and the market's just not growing like like it has been over the last few years. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, situation there where you've got this like huge supply. And uh, some of you may have listened to, uh, we, we did a LinkedIn live. Um, well, Ned, you were, you were off in Istanbul, um, but yes. I, uh, but I did a, <laughs> but I did a LinkedIn live um, uh, webinar or whatever you call it, uh, just discussing, you know, kind of the state of the industry, the airline industry at large. And one of the points we we discussed is uh, the this whole idea that there's this big supply chain problem throughout the industry. You know, the GTF engines are a great example of that, where there's just you know this tremendous supply side disruption, and it's an interesting question or you know discussion to have is you know as frustrating as these dis- supply side disruptions are, is it in the end net positive for the industry because it's like you mentioned that it's you know, restricting supply capacity. So it's bringing up yields and, and <laughs> arguably profits. Uh, now, I think in the aggregate industry-wide, it probably is positive. It's probably, you can make that case. Now for some of these airlines that have to deal with the GTF issue in particular directly, I think it's probably more <laughs> more bad than good. Um, it just sounds like such a nightmare. I mean, if you're Valaris or Hawaiian, just the two, the two airlines we were talking about, I mean, you know, let alone there's the Indigos in India and, you know, just just everywhere you just hear airlines complain about this, um, pro- probably a net negative. Now, interestingly enough, this I found this to be interesting. So in, uh, as you mentioned, Ned, um, 5% operating margin uh, just this past third quarter. In the third quarter of 2019, Volaris actually had an 18% operating margin. And interestingly enough, at that time in 2019, their rival Aero Mexico was dealing with 737 MAX issues. Remember the MAX was grounded at the time and they were having all sorts of problems. So because of that, Volaris benefited. Now that the NEOs have the problem, you wonder if Aeromexico with their MAXs are benefiting. Um, Unfortunately, Aeromexico does not, uh, they are not a public company anymore, so they don't release the results. So we might, we may never know, but uh, they, I imagine they are benefiting from this. Uh, Interesting, you know, what comes around goes around. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. And so one of the things that, that Valeris highlighted was, of course, the, the U.S. upgrade for to Category 1 status of Mexico safety rating and the growth that they can now engage into the U.S. Uh, we've seen Viva Aerobus. Valeris is probably number one budget competitor really expanding. They've added, I've lost count, but more than 20, they've announced more than 20 new routes to the U.S., most of them launching next year. But Valeris has not uh, gone over you know, over the top and announced new routes. They said they will be shifting four aircraft in December uh, that were that are currently serving Mexico City to U.S. routes. So that's a little bit of the capacity discipline in the domestic market that they're forced to to make. Uh, but they're gonna they're gonna use those for new U.S. markets, which they expect to be accretive to the bottom line. Now, an analyst did ask how much they were concerned about all the new U.S. competition. Would that necessarily lower yields there? And Valeris didn't seem to think they they talked to um and talked about how their market very robust VFR, uh, you know, a lot of Mexican nationals and families returning back and forth, and and that market tends to is continues to be very robust and is different from the market that we see a lot of the U.S. airlines competing for. So they're they're optimistic about that. And then another question about. Mexico that came up was the the launch of the new Mexicana, which is going to uh, be run by 
the Mexican military and based. Yes, I know, of, Ned, you're, you're very bullish on that, right? You're, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, state run airlines uh, have a great history of success in leading the industry. <laughs> um, yeah, Valeris isn't that concerned. They said it would only compete with about one to two percent of their ASMs. Uh, next year, uh, the the new Mexicano will be based at uh, Mexico City's new Felipe Angeles Airport. So uh, Valera serves the airport, but it doesn't. It's not a huge uh, node on their map. So it's really they don't see it as a huge competitive pressure at this point. So it's a uh, there's a lot going on, but Valera seems actually rather bullish about next year, and most of that's just because growth is going to slow down a lot. It's it really what I took away. Yeah, interesting. There's there's a few there's a lot of things swirling through my head now. I mean, one is just that uh, are they experiencing any of the same sort of ultra low cost carrier troubles that you know are so well documented now with Frontier and Spirit? Um, you know, is there is there something? There's some commonality there in terms of what's ailing these business I models. I didn't hear it. They did not talk about demand not, yeah. slowing down or anything. You know, funny demand actually came up very little during the call. There was so much focus on sort of the numbers, but they they really, um, yeah. The Enrique did mention at the end of sort of the call they they expect continued strong demand versus limited supply, and that's you know going to be good for the Mexican airlines. So. I'd say no. And but also we have to remember that Mexico is a market where airlines have far lower penetration than US airlines do. I mean, the thing is, is you're simulating the market in Mexico and you're almost you're creating new flyers and hopefully people will continue to fly. Whereas in the US, like like most people have flown, maybe they only fly once a year, and Spirit and Frontier are really trying to maybe push that up but it's much more a discretionary purchase at that point for spirit and frontier so uh, they, they are know, very yeah. they are very different markets i mean the other thing that characterizes mexico is you know the new mexicana uh thing aside the mexican airline industry is really just three airlines for a pretty big country um so you th you think that the uh you know, it, it would be not too difficult to earn high margins in a market like that. I mean, Brazil is the same situation. That's an even larger country with just three major right. airlines. And they, and I, I suspect that all three of those airlines are going to be report very good third quarter results. Um, uh, or just, you know, third quarter that happens to be not the greatest season down there, but, but you get my point. I mean, I think, I think they're doing very well. So, you know, there, there's that. Um, one other point I wanted to bring up, I did happen to listen, uh, was it yesterday, uh, Asur, which is uh, one of the Mexican airport companies. Yes. Uh, they happen to own Cancun. They, they operate the Cancun airport is their biggest. And I don't remember a couple others, a um, couple other sizable ones. One of the things they did mention is that because so the Mexican peso has actually been very, un it's very uncommon among current foreign currencies this year. Um, has been very strong versus the U.S. dollar. Now it's weakened some over the past couple of months, but uh, for much of the year, it's been very, very strong, and that's actually hurt tourism. And they, I saw her mention that that you know a place like Cancun, it becomes when your local currency gets uh, you know increases in value, it becomes more expensive to visit. So if you're an yeah. American, you know the yeah you, you get to Cancun and everything's just more expensive. So that is one thing that probably, uh, you know, goes uh, against uh, an airline like Valaris right now. But like I said, I think I think the you know I think the currency has come down a bit in the last couple of months. So we'll see how that plays. Obviously, for the for the tourist markets, for the beach tourist markets like Cancun, your most important time of the year is your you think your first quarter. You know, your January's, February's, especially February, March. When uh, you know spring break and you know the weather is horrible in like places like where we live, uh, <laughs> um, northeast U.S., people want to rush down to the beach. So uh, that'll be important to see what the currency value is uh, when we you know start to get into the early part of next year. Absolutely, and, and like I said, I can only you know keep quoting what what Valera said, but they they see continued strong demand. And the truth is, is a lot of their traffic, that VFR traffic is, and Mexican point of origin traffic, really, you know, VFR travelers are going to go visit at the holidays, whether, you know, whether the dollar shifted versus the peso a little or not, 
you yeah. know, they're, those trips are kind of baked in for, for major holidays, that is. It, it could, although although I would it, say, yes. I mean, there are, yeah, there might might be someone who's, well, let's, let's we were going to do three trips this year to visit grandma. We're only going to do two because it's expensive this year. I, I think there's some of that, too. There's it some could, of that, yes, but yeah. it's less of a discretionary trip than yeah, someone in America and like going, let's go to Cancun. Oh, no, it's really expensive. Let's go to Florida. Like, right, you're correct. Um, yeah. You're right. Yes, they could pull in a little bit, uh, two trips instead of three. But I think it's less of a discretionary fun thing than than pure leisure travelers. Are. Yeah, or they might say, you know, when we're there, we won't, uh, you know, we won't take that side trip or whatever, but we will still fly. So it doesn't. If anything, it's good for Valerius because people could like be go, oh, we're not going to be for Aeromexico, which, you know, and fly Valerius or Viva Aerobus, I, I'd argue. The whole like trading down, yeah, idea. trade down yeah, to save a little money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so. That's, for the record, I did have a trip. This is this is a year or and a half ago. I took a trip to Mexico, and I was pricing Valeris versus Aero Mexico out because there are two nonstop airlines on the route. And once I added, you know, I had my kids, I had suitcases. Once I added it all together, it really was no savings to take Valeris versus Aero Mexico. It was a okay. matter of dollars, and I was like. Yeah, I'd rather do the full service carrier than you know a budget carrier. But that's just, interesting. That was, so yeah. you have, so you have, you've never flown Volaris. I have. I, I have flown them once years okay. ago, but um, in that case, it's it's just I it, example of a low cost carrier is not always the cheapest option. Once you add in all of the extras, it's uh, so you know, just always keep your eye out. Right. Yeah. No. No. That's that's there are us, but particularly if you're yeah if you're flying with kids and you got a lot of bags and things like that, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So are we, uh, do we have time to talk about Europe or uh, are we running out of time here now? I think we just spent 20 minutes chatting about Hawaiian and Valeris. I think we're <laughs> going to cut it there, Jay. That's... We're, we're too, we're too long winded, but make sure you check out airline weekly this week. Cause we got a lot of stuff on, uh, it'll be very fitting. meaty. It, we had a lot of Europe stuff. Yeah. A lot of Europe yeah. stuff. And so, if you uh, haven't, and, and listeners, if you haven't already, please sign up. The Skift Aviation Forum will be on Wednesday, November 1st in Fort Worth, Texas. We will both be there. We're happy to chat. And uh, we we know, yeah, we hope to see you there. Yeah, we got a lot of interesting speakers. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, you, will, you won't regret it if you come. And uh, it's, um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, what else, Ned? What else we got on tap here? I think that's about it. All right, Jay. All right. Sounds good. Always a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.